the ultimate result of this, there was no useful information obtained. Is that true? Yeah, I would argue. Um, you know, if you want to judge the useful information in terms of scientific papers by the number of times they were cited, um, the novel discoveries that were made, you know, there was, they simply confirmed what they already knew. These papers were not cited, to the best of my knowledge, by anyone. Um, and in fact, many of the, the papers didn't get published, and I wonder if it's because they didn't pass peer review um, for being simply stating the obvious. So, you know, it's, it's difficult to tell. One of the problems that I, that I have with this research is I don't have the personal records of a lot of the scientists who are involved in it. People like Tisdall, I've been, if anyone knows where I can find them, I've been searching for them, even though he was probably the most famous nutrition expert in Canada of the mid 20th century. Um, his records after he died suddenly in 1948, I don't think they were kept. Um, and so I'm still looking for them. <laughs> Um, but that would probably shed light on, on what exactly, you know, the, the, the broader context of this was. Yeah. Do you have any reflections on, on uh, sort of the uh, discipline of history and sort of popular Canadian views of our history and, and the sort of hole we have in terms of the original history of Canada and, and how the discipline of history can help or, or hinder how, whether it has in the future the discipline of history in broadening our view to include Aboriginal history in our, the popular uh, view of Canadian history. I mean, I, well, I think you know, one of the things that, that research like this can do is to remind Canadians that colonialism didn't end you know, sometime in the 17th or 18th century and that it's an ongoing process that continues to this day, and the fact that the survivors of these experiments are, you know, many are still alive, and I've, I've had the, the privilege to talk to them. Um, and so this is not the distant past. This is the present. These experiments may have happened in the 40s and 50s, but the reverberations continue to this day. Um, so that's one thing that I think historians can remind the public of. Another thing is that the residential school experiments, I think a lot of Canadians think that, you know, there was some abuse by bad apples within the, the system, but overall, you know, the system wasn't particularly horrific. Well, these experiments are a sign that the, the abuse at schools was not just of, you know, sexual abuse or physical abuse. It was um, every aspect of the children's lives was, a, to a certain extent, um, guided by these, you know, Problematic assumption: the fact that you know across the country, nearly to to a school, every school had serious problems of malnutrition. Um, the long-term effects of that on communities is is devastating, and it's it's hard to even fathom. So, you know, hopefully, historians um, studying the the history of you know Canadian colonialism in the 20th century can remind Canadians that this is not done. You know. A single apology for residential schools is not enough, um, and and you know that that we you know real truth and reconciliation also requires you know the government to actively do something. You have your hand up, yeah. Did this have any impact on in terms of things like vitamin supplements on Canadian foreign aid at the time? A lot of which was things like wheat and flour sent abroad. Yeah, I've been trying to track whether or not this did have an impact on that. One thing that, that is happening during this period is the Canadian, in Canada, fortification of things like flour, um, you know, margarine, milk, things like that were, um, it, much of it was illegal. It was illegal to fortify flour until the mid-1950s. And so part of this was these experiments were to, you know, justify this, this change in policy that was happening over this period. Um, it's a good question about foreign aid, and I'm trying to find where this research went. The problem is, um, is that the documents are spread all over, especially the, the post-1952 period. Um, and so that's, that's what I'm currently working on, to try to figure out the diffusion. Yeah. Um, I was 
you in preparing for it, not your talk, but for my class today, I was reading an um, uh, article on indigenous methodology by Margaret Kovac. And one of the things she was citing, um, I think it's Linda uh, Tilawaki Smith, who said to most indigenous people, research is a dirty word. So I thought this was uh, uh, very fitting that I read this before walking in. <laughs> um, but I was um, just wondering about, uh, you know, I had a couple of questions. First, about um, you know, how your has your research fed into the TRC process in Canada right now? And um, yeah, I'm curious as to what you were looking for uh, when you came across this. Yeah. Um, you know, how your research agenda has changed, and if I'm permitted another question, you know, what, mm -hmm. you know, sort of like that first question about what are, what are the practical implications do you see it in terms of you know issues to it. Uh, dealing with food security with indigenous people. Yeah, well, well, you know, in one way, this working, both working on this project and the response to it has fundamentally changed my, my research direction. Um, and especially having the opportunity to speak with survivors, both of the experiments and of the residential school system more generally, to realize that this story of malnutrition, this story of exploitation, there's much more to it that needs to be told. Um, and so, you know, I'm currently shifting my research to look at the, the broader effects of this sort of nutritional colonialism being conducted, you know, by, by you know, in large part by federal government employed scientists, um, both before and after this period. So that's, that's part of it. It's definitely had an effect on, on my research agenda. In terms of the TRC, um, you know, it was, by sheer luck that the TRC the week before had been arguing mention of their mandate because they released all the documents that they said they were going to and this article had the effect of pointing out that there is much more that we don't know and that in fact until those documents are released there can't be truth and reconciliation so you know hopefully that has some effect I know the Manitoba legislature passed um, a motion calling for the extension of the the TRC based on their response to this um, uh, to this research, um, and one of the things that I'm trying to get across in my current research and and and, um, and in giving talks about this is that this this should speak to hopefully contemporary medical and scientific researchers who are going into indigenous communities, um, and they should ask themselves where are the benefits flowing, you know, and I would argue that they're disproportionately flowing to the researchers. You know, for a researcher to come into a community and study diabetes, for instance, and then to leave and publish papers, well, what are they leaving behind? And are they really actually having an effect on these communities? And given the legacy of what happened in these communities, things need to be fundamentally different. Um, and so, you know, both researchers and Canadians in general need to ask themselves, um, whether or not some of these same assumptions as well, you know, this, this also this idea of a nutritional transition between traditional and modern food in which traditional is a static pre-contact diet and modern is, you know, a diet that indigenous people supposedly have not reached. This is an extraordinarily problematic, extraordinarily value-laden assumption um, that, is, that is really not helpful and doesn't acknowledge the effects of systemic causes and the effects of you know, Canada's colonial policies on indigenous diets. Yeah. Um, I think if we look at certain developing regions around the world, we can see similar, um, you know, uh, social engineering being done. Mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. you know, splinter ethnic groups in Asia, or Africa, or Latin America. So, do you have any? I mean, what what are your recommendations for Canada? You know, having its own experience. What do you think? Can Canadian government uh, has, you know, an obligation and the, time, the right timing for us to start voicing out these concerns regarding groups around the world? Well, I think it, may, it should make people think about when Canada uh, is engaging in, in aid projects, whether or not they're simply, you know, reimposing these, these ideas of, you know, we have experts coming in and will tell you how to make your diet better, will tell you, and ignoring the fact that most causes of malnutrition are structural and economic. Um, 
And it's the same way. One of the problems with all of these studies was they all assumed that the solution required cultural change and, and you know, an imposition to reform indigenous cultures. Well, and arguably, a lot of foreign aid and a lot of um, the research being done in, in the developing world brings with it those same assumptions. Yeah. Well, one of the great things about the coverage of your, your work is it brought out <coughs> excuse me, a bunch of other studies in the media coverage. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking in particular of the, the book by the professor from Saskatchewan, The yeah. the Plains. Yep. And, and uh, so it showed the combination of your work and, and these other pe pieces of work. It showed the kind of, cis there's a continuity of how the approach of using starvation, using nutritional experiments, it's all part of the pattern of colonialism you just described it. And uh, I'm just kind of, what, what did you think of, of that, those, the other pieces that have come out and, and the potential for putting together a, a you know, pretty interesting, if, if uh, horrifying story yeah. with a combination of those uh, different studies. And there's probably more of them that, that are in the his, history literature that we don't even know about. Well, I think the important point is food and colonialism. Food is, you know, one of the key tools of Canadian colonialism, whether it's, you know, in the 20th century, 19th century, 18th century. The, um, as I talk to my students on, on Monday in my food history class about, you know, the dispossession of Indigenous peoples from access to food and other resources was fundamental to the colonial enterprise um, and fundamental for the transfer of wealth away from indigenous peoples to European settlers. Thank you for your wonderful research and study. It's just so important and uh, it's uh, fantastic to see that academic research has taken up in public sphere and uh, resonating. It's very exciting. Um, I have all sorts of questions that I'd like to ask you that I want to be followed with about uh, the little tears in the archive. I just can't imagine the experience of reading kids' letters and uh, sort of uh, Sort of emotional growth tradition in the But just a context question in the very first question. I don't really get to go nutrition research, but I assume there's some sort of lineage uh, that this is part of the nutrition research maybe back to poor houses in the UK and Ireland or something. Is there is there sort of a, a historical precept for this sort of work being done, whether to kids or prisoners? Is, was this a kind of an accepted methodology, if you like, in, in, in nutrition research prior to or yeah, there, there definitely is. Nutrition research often did, you know, make extensive use of vulnerable populations. Um, there's, you know, one of the classic examples is a, a scurvy study done done to um, Jewish orphans in New York City. I think it's New York City in in the 1910s or 1920s, in which students were actively given scurvy to test the effects of you know, what requirements were for vitamin C. And so there is, there is a lineage, but there's also that experiment, where there was a public backlash against it. And so there, to a certain extent, there may not have been rules around research ethics on human beings. So, you know, a researcher would not have to go before an ethics board and ask for permission. But there was also um, a sense that researchers were supposed to govern the ethics of their own work. And the fact that these children were malnourished on such a large scale, and it was the government conducting the research. Obviously, there was, you know, some problematic ethical aspects that go beyond, um, you know, you can't simply go back and say, well, they didn't know any better. Um, especially in northern Manitoba, they, they did know better, in fact. They knew that these people, especially the elderly residents, were starving. Um, and so it is, it is a bit complicated to talk about a, you know, judging the ethics of research in the past. Um, but so there, the short answer is yes, there is, a, there is clearly a context. And one of the things that, the ways I approach this is in, in my research on these, these same nutrition experts and their work during the Second World War is there's a huge controversy within the, um, the community of um, dietitians, um, biochemists, Etc. about what, how to define human requirements for different nutrients. And in fact, these experiments came out of those debates over, you know, if, if we don't know how to define